In Chapter 15, we'll be looking at infrared spectroscopy and mass spectrometry. In introduction to spectroscopy, that is a technique that involves an interaction between matter and light, specifically electromagnetic radiation. Light can be thought of as waves of energy or different packets of particles of energies called photons. Light waves include wavelength and frequency. So you've seen this chart before. There are many wavelengths of light that cannot be observed with the eyes, so we can only see this part of it. We'll be focusing on this infrared here for infrared spectroscopy. So when light interacts with molecules, the effect depends on the wavelength of light used. So if we have NMR spectroscopy, that deals with radio waves. And the information that we can get from NMR is the specific arrangement of all carbon and hydrogen atoms in the compound. So again, NMR tells us how carbons and hydrogens are arranged in a compound. IR spectroscopy uses infrared, and that tells us what functional groups are present. UV vis, which we won't look at a whole lot, is visible in ultraviolet light, and that lets us know about any conjugated pi systems. So for each bond, there's a vibrational energy, and those are separated by gaps, which are quantized. So if a photon of light strikes the molecule with a specific amount of energy, it's going to cause a vibration, and the energy released from the molecule is generally emitted in light. So infrared causes this molecular vibration, and the difference between the allowed energy levels is determined by the types of bonds. So you get this difference in energy after the vibrations, and that's going to give off some sort of light. So molecular bonds can vibrate by stretching like a spring, or they can bend. Kind of if you think of scissors, you have in-plane bending and vibrating like scissors, or it can do an out-of-plane bend or vibration. So if you were thinking about how you might swing your arms back and forth, that would be an out-of-plane vibration. So as a bond stretches or bends, there's a characteristic frequency observed, and that depends on the mass of the atom. So a heavier atom will have a lower frequency, the strength of a bond. If you have a stronger bond, that's going to give a higher frequency. And with dipoles, you have strong dipoles, strong absorption. If there's no dipole, there's not going to be any absorption. Infrared spectroscopy is used with night vision goggles. So you have vibrating bonds that can be demoted to a lower vibrational state, and that emits IR. And warm objects are able to release some of the energy in the form of IR radiation. IR can also be used in thermal imaging. Cancer cells give off more heat than normal non-cancerous cells, so they can use that to image cancer cells, but this is not a great method of detection because there's a lot of errors involved there. So mammography is often a better method for detection. So with IR, the energy necessary to cause vibration depends on the type of the bond, which we mentioned before. So something can have a large gap or it can have a small gap. So the frequencies absorbed tell us the sample types. It tells us what kinds of functional groups are present. So in IR spectrophotometer, it radiates a sample with all frequencies of IR light. The frequencies that are absorbed by the sample tell us the types of functional groups that are present. It goes through a prism of light, the sample does, and it sends that information to the detector. So light's passing through a molecular sample. It's absorbed at a specific frequency after it's been vibrated. Any light that's left over is transmitted to the detector, and a spectrum of light transmittance is obtained where reductions in transmittance indicates the bonds of a sample. What does that mean for you guys exactly? So up to this point, they've given you a little bit of theory in the book about how things work, but in this class, we're mainly concerned with, can you look at a spectrum and tell me what it tells you? So a signal on the IR spectrum has three important characteristics. There's the wave number, like I mentioned. So certain types of functional groups will show up at specific wave numbers. So that's one. We have intensity. So there are strong peaks here versus the weaker ones. These are weaker peaks, so they're not as intense. And then the shape of the peak. We have sharp peaks, and these are broad. So that tells us different things as well. There's different regions. So this table corresponds to the wave numbers. In the under 1600 region, this is called the fingerprint region. We have CC single bonds, CN single bonds, and also CO. 
and between 1600 and 1850, that's where the double bonds tend to show up. So we have a carbon-carbon double bond, carbon double bond to a nitrogen, or a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. If there's any molecules with the triple bonds, those tend to show up between 2100 to 2300. And then the bonds to hydrogen show up above 2700. So that's XH. Here, X can equal an OH hydrogen, an NH, or a CH. So in this region above 1600, that is the diagnostic region. So that tells us more information than the fingerprint region does. What I mean by that is if we look at the diagnostic region, this here is broad strong peak that indicates an OH group, which we would see for this molecule here. That's the OH that it's telling us about. These are CH peaks from an sp3 carbon. So we can see that, but there's an alcohol with one less carbon here. It has that same broad OH peak and very similar CH sp3 peaks. So these from the diagnostic area look almost identical with maybe a little bit of difference here. And even though their fingerprint regions are different, it's very hard to decipher one from the other if we're just looking at it. Uh, notice that IR also doesn't tell us how many carbons. We just know that there are CH sp3 carbons and we have an OH group in both of those. So the fingerprint region is not very useful. Okay, so I mentioned the wave numbers. If you have wave numbers that are below 3000, these are your CH on sp3 carbons. So your single bonded alkanes. If you have something that is over 3000, and that is the, the defining line there. So if it's under 3000, it's a CH that's sp3. If it's over 3000, this is a CH on a double bonded carbon. So this is an sp2. And then again, for the below is C. H for sp3. For alkynes, which are sp CHs, those have a very characteristic peak and those show up around 3300. You can tell a lot of information for functional group wise and what kind of carbons you have from IR. So is it possible that an alkene or an alkyne could give an IR spectra without any signals above 3000 wave numbers. It is possible. If you remember the alkene or alkyne, uh, the signals around 3000 are for carbon hydrogens. If we're predicting these now, this molecule right here will have these sp3 CHs. Those are less than 3000. And it also has one CH that is sp2. So that one will be above 3000. This compound, however, is not going to have any CHs that are sp2, but we will see this OH that is around 3400. This has the sp, so if we had an H on there, that would show up above 3000, but there's no hydrogens here, so there's no sp CHs. And the same with the sp2, no sp2. CHs. Other signature peaks include ketones. So a ketone shows up around 1720. If it's a conjugated ketone, meaning it having a double bond right next to it, that is around 1680. And that's in wave numbers. And the reason for this happening being lower is we can draw a resonance structure here. So if you look at this now, the oxygen has some single CO character and the carbon-carbon double bond character. So this is going to show up a little bit lower because of the resonance. So that will bring that value down. An ester shows up around 1740. And this ester, it's conjugated, is around 1710. Again, you can draw a resonance structure there. So if you are starting to freak out with having to remember all of these numbers, there will be a table that you can use on the exam so you don't have to try to memorize all these because that would be impossible. Not impossible, but it's not something I expect. So the signal strength we saw can vary. You, so you can have a weak signal or you can have a strong signal. The more polar the bond, the greater the opportunity for interaction of those things. So more polar equals strong signal.
All right, so signal strength, as time passes here, the bond can vibrate some more. I mean, as it vibrates, you have this very polar CO bond versus this one here, even though it's vibrating, there's not much difference between the polarities here. So there's greater signal with the CO bond versus the CC double bond. Symmetrical bonds are completely inefficient at absorbing radiation, so you usually don't see a signal. So this would be where a, a double bond carbon-carbon would show up, but because this is symmetrical, it's not making any difference here, so there's no signal there. For this one would be around 1,500 to 2,000, but it won't show up because of the symmetry. We can also have different shapes for peaks, so we've seen the broad signal and also the narrow signal. The OH here can hydrogen bond to another OH, which is often why we get this broad peak. And this is a free OH. So if you have concentrated alcohols, this will give very broad signals because that's all it is, is alcohols very close to each other that can hydrogen bond to each other, so it broadens things out. But if you have an alcohol that is very dilute, it won't be able to find other alcohols of itself so it won't hydrogen bond as much, and so you get a sharper peak. This is the characteristic shape for a carboxylic acid, and it is very ugly. So this big broad thing here is the OH from the carboxylic acid. And this is the C double bond O part of the carboxylic acid. All right, and the reason that the peak is so ugly you have one carboxylic acid here that's a carbon double bond to oxygen with the OH this can hydrogen bond to another carbonyl and that OH can bond to that carbonyl so because you have that hydrogen bonding that's going to stretch out this peak it's much more pronounced in carboxylic acid because they can form these H bonding dimers. So when you see this big, ugly, fat, wide peak, that's very indicative of a carboxylic acid. Nitrogens are capable of hydrogen bonding as well. So this first one is an IR of hexylamine. So these two teeth here represent the two hydrogens that are on nitrogen. This right here is piperidine, which is a secondary amine. So there's only one NH here, so we see one NH in the IR. So if you have this teeth pattern around 3,500, when you have this double tooth pattern, you get the NH2 if it's just a single around this area that's NH. Notice this is not as broad as the OH, so that would be the difference between those two. There would be no signal for a tertiary amine. So if we had N with three CH3s, there'd be no signal because there's no NHs. So if you look at this, what functional group is present here? So this has that big ugly, this is the OH. This one here is a carbonyl. So this is a carboxylic acid. This one, the teeth aren't as nice looking, but there's two little teeth there, so this is an NH2. So that's all that we can say about these molecules from IR, is that we have a carboxylic acid and here is a free amine. This is a table similar to what you might get on the quiz or exam, except I'll have the names of the functional groups here instead of the actual functional groups, so you'll have to know those. So you can see for single bonds, you have the OH around 3200, 3600. Carboxylic acids show up here. And note that some of them will need two peaks. So carboxylic acid, you have this peak, and you also have this one right here. So you can see the different uh, ranges of the single CH bonds. We have the triple bonds, the double bonds here, the carbonyls, and then the aromatic rings as well. Okay, so which compound with the following molecular formula, C6H10O, fits the spectra? So if we're going to look to analyze this here, well, I'm going to focus on the diagnostic region. So we can kind of ignore 
what's over here and look at the next thing. First, really draw my 3000 line to see where my SP2s or SP3s are at. So this one tells me I have an SP2 peak right there, just above 3000. So any compounds that don't have SP2 CHs, I can rule out. So this one we can rule out because there's no SP2 CHs. This has one, this has one, this has one. This does not, those two we can rule out. The next peak is an sp3ch so if we don't have sp3ch's we can rule that one out we can also rule this one out so all of them have sp3ch's that are left so we'll go on to the next peak this right here is a c double bond o the 1720 so i can rule out this this is not a c double bond o this is not a c double bond o so we have the carbonyl here with the double bond on the end or this conjugated one so one thing if you remember back this ketone so this ketone shows up around 1720. If you have a conjugated ketone right here, which is the double bond next to the ketone, those show up around 1680. So this is our best candidate for the IR spectra here.